Hello and welcome to The Pulse. Unprecedented, extraordinary, mind-boggling, choose your own adjective for describing the American elections. From the distance of Hong Kong, another adjective might be confusing. Coming to think of it, it's pretty confusing stateside as well. So we're going to do our best to shed some light on all of this. If you count the legal votes, I easily win. If you count the illegal votes, they can try to steal the election from us. Each ballot must be counted. Statements by both candidates in the United States presidential election this morning Hong Kong time were pretty much in character. With former Vice President Joe Biden essentially referencing the Constitution and President Donald Trump aggrieved that it doesn't look like he'll get the win he craves. Several US TV networks found the president's comments so dubious that they simply cut away from him. So far, there's no landslide victory for either side. The per-hoped-for Democrat blue wave did not happen, which, at least as the count continues, casts a shadow of uncertainty over the country. A record high number of Americans have voted in this year's election. The U.S. Elections Project says that more than 100 million early votes were cast, either by mail or in person. That's more than two-thirds of the total number of votes cast in 2016. The project also predicted an overall record turnout of about 150 million, around 65 percent of eligible voters, the highest since 1908. With the majority of uncounted votes in both Georgia and Pennsylvania, either one of which Trump needs for an outright win, due to coming from pro-Democrat areas, the dynamic is strongly in Biden's favor. The Democratic challenger is also well ahead of Trump in the popular vote by some 3.5 million votes. At the moment, Biden has over 73 million votes, the highest number ever received by a presidential candidate, and Trump over 69 million. It's the seventh time in eight elections that a Democrat has won the popular vote. However, the presidency isn't decided by the popular vote, mm -hmm. but by the Electoral College, in which each state has a set number of votes to award a candidate. At the moment, if we don't count Arizona as a confirmed victory for Biden, he is taking the lead with 253 electoral votes. Trump has 213. Biden only needs 17 more votes to reach 270 and win the presidency. All eyes are on toss-up states including Arizona, Nevada, Pennsylvania and Georgia as ballot counting continues to narrow gaps between the two candidates. In Georgia and Pennsylvania, President Trump's lead has been diminishing by the hour. In Arizona, he has been catching up. Since election night, sporadic protests have broken out across the country. If uh, the president loses by a slim margin and refuses to leave, but there's enough questions about ballot counting and uh, submission dates, and then his uh, party mates in the Congress decide that an investigation needs to be done or that it needs to go to the Supreme Court, then it could be a really bad time, a, a time of turmoil as the nation negotiates the counting, the outcome, and then uh, officiating the results. In this neck-to-neck -neck Trump Biden contest, we've seen historically high campaign spending. And the critical question is, are we seeing power shifts in the Congress? The party with a majority in the Senate can determine the success or otherwise of the next president's legislative agenda. In this election, the Democrats vowed to flip the Senate. They need to gain at least three more Senate seats to get a majority. Again, Georgia comes into play, with two Senate candidates likely to be decided by runoff contests in January. There's not likely to be much of a power shift in the lower house. The Democrats maintain their majority in the House of Representatives.
while the status quo could be maintained in Congress, that is seeming increasingly unlikely in the White House. We'll take a closer look at New York to find out how Asian Americans evaluate the past four years of Trump's presidency and who they've picked to lead the country next. Every vote counts. New York City is home to the largest ethnic Chinese population in the United States with 12 Chinatowns. There are about 235 million eligible voters in the United States based on the 2019 census data. So out of that, 5% are eligible Asian American voters. And then among or eligible Asian American voters, Chinese voters consist 23% of that. This president paid 50 times the tax in China, has a secret bank account with China, does business in China. I don't make money from China, you do. I don't make money from Ukraine, you do. What issues did Chinese Americans in the city consider most important in this year's election? On election day, voting queues in this Chinatown in Flushing, Queens were short. We asked voters how they feel about this year's election and found that some are switching parties. This is the most important four years for the American people. Yeah, you can have own choice, but I think Biden got to be response. Four years ago, I voted Trump. I think he can make change, big change, but to be honest, it's not the right thing to do that. So. Sunny Xiao is a researcher at AAPI Data, a publisher of demographic data and policy research on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. In September, the center published a survey of Asian American voters' preferences and concerns. And so since 2016, we've been tracking how many Chinese American voters are self-identified as Republican versus Democrats. So in 2016, the number for Chinese voters is that 13% of them identify as Democrats. And in 2018, the number, it, the number was 34%. And this year, the number was 38%. And then, so you can see a little bit of growth there. And similar pattern actually happened among self-identified Republican Chinese voters. For Chinese Americans who perhaps were identified as independent and then now identify themselves as Democrats, a huge driving force was Trump's rhetoric about uh, the COVID virus. Um, his rhetoric about calling it the China virus has made them think that if they don't make their voice heard, meaning voting Donald Trump out of the office, their children will leave with, will have to grow up in a very, uh, very biased and racially discriminated environment. And that's something they don't want to see. Uh, another factor was not just the rhetoric, but over the government handling of COVID-19 that has impacted them economically. A lot of Chinese Americans are small business owners. So they really depend on government's policy regarding those businesses, and that's why they really focused on the economic policy this year compared to any other election. Although some Asian American voters are switching from the Republicans to the Democrats, one group that is increasing support for the GOP is that of Hong Kong immigrants. It's been estimated that around 40,000 ethnic Chinese in the city are from Hong Kong. The 2019 Hong Kong protests sharply divided the community. This is Manson Lai, RTHK's The Pulse, reporting from New York City. Li Pengwing owns a bakery in Rago Park, Queens. He and his son Han Li both support Donald Trump. Donald Trump 
，你邊個做總統，我哋都要納税嘅，但係即係起碼安定嚟做做生意啊，生活咁嘅咁解啫。你想佢會做到啲乜嘢咧？我疫情搞好啲啦。民生各個有工作啦，呢啲啲啲在所難免必然㗎啦。咁啊，對於香港問題，希望佢幫幫佢一把啦，咁樣支持下啲香港啲啲留學生咁咯。His son Han, also born in Hong Kong, has lived here for twenty years. 我上一次係投希拉里嘅，主要都係投希拉里，因為我覺得。當侵講啲嘢好似空口講白話咁樣，但係經過呢四年，我覺得佢係一個得出做得到嘅人咯。起碼舊年香港嘅運動，佢有呢個香港人權民主法案啦，同埋呢個制裁名單啦，咁樣又幫香港人發個聲咯。Welcome back. One thing, and probably one thing only, is clear about this election. It marks the largest turnout in US elections since 1900. Aside from that, more or less everything is in dispute as legal action is threatened, allegations of fraud impressively flow out of the White House, and a profound air of uncertainty hovers. To help us make sense of all of this, we have in the studio David Law, Chair in Public Law at Hong Kong University, and I'm pleased to welcome back Sean Kenji Stars, Assistant Professor in the Department of Asian and International Studies at Hong Kong City University. Before we got going, I should mention that this is being recorded on Friday morning, and it's quite possible that a great deal will change by the time the programme is broadcast. I don't think we can disagree on that point. <laughs> but let me ask you first... What do you think, given what we know about the election, it tells us about America and where America is at the moment? Well, I mean, maybe the biggest uh, shock again for the second time is that the polls, again, uh, are perhaps even more wrong than in 2016. Uh, so most people predicted a Biden landslide, a complete blowout for, jo for Joe Biden. I mean, some people were predicting 400 electoral votes. Um, it is clearly not that. This is a nail biter, and it looks like even a bigger nail biter than 2016. Uh, so Donald Trump has gained in every demographic, according to exit polls, every demographic except for white men. So he's gained in black women, black men, Hispanic men, Hispanic. He's gained uh, with L LGBTQ community. So, I mean, one thing that has been said over and over again over the past four years is that Trump's coalition is basically a bunch of white supremacists, white nationalists, racists, and so on. Now, of course, there is a sizable chunk of his coalition that, is, that, that message appeals to. But clearly, there's other things going on. I think, you know, we're also seeing evidence of some demographic shifts that people have been anticipating for some time. This idea that Georgia and North Carolina would be competitive. The idea that Arizona would be competitive for a Democrat, you know, as recently as 10 or 20 years ago, was basically unthinkable. And so the Republicans, uh, I think some of the more far-sighted establishment Republicans have been worried for some time that these demographic shifts, uh, the, the people that Trump is playing to are not really the demographic future of America. And who knows when this is going to begin to, to really uh, unfold, but I think we're starting to see it already, again, in places like the near south, Georgia, North, North Carolina. Virginia's already tipped. Arizona's tipping now. So we may, it may be that uh, if we wait a bit longer, we will begin to see the kinds of trends that people were expecting. Sean, can I just come back to you? Because I, I sense you don't quite agree on this question of the ethnic divide. Yeah, so I think um, this is definitely part of it, but it's not the whole story. And I think the untold story is class. So in uh, 2016, up to 9 million voters who voted for Barack Obama in 2008 and or 2012 voted for Trump, they shifted to Trump. So I don't think we can say that most of them are, are racist and so on. And many of them, of course, are um, multi-ethnic as well, diverse. And then Trump's uh, diverse base has increased even more in 2020. So I think there's another story going on here. So there's a, there's a populist anti-establishment, especially anti-liberal establishment, um, movements in the U.S. on both the, the far right and the far left, so Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump. And, um, and we can see this in, in a lot of the, uh, the, the, the polls. So, you know, even Fox News said in their exit polls, 71% of voters support government-run health care. That was, you know, their framing. Um, in Florida, uh, Trump won by a bigger margin than everyone thought. 
But what also won was increasing the minimum wage from $7.25 to $15 an hour, which is, of course, Bernie Sanders' prime... Uh, one of but his it was main. in the Democratic platform as well. Bernie Sanders' uh, task force uh, put that in the Democratic platform. So, you know, so Americans generally are... It's, it's underestimated the extent to which they're socially conservative still, but economically liberal. Do you, David, think that the um, American electorate is as polarized as people keep saying? Because usually in elections, extreme positions are adopted and, and they come, you know, narrowing down to this comfy little consensus by the time the real business of government starts happening. Right, and what's unusual here too as well is that the American, the design of the American electoral system tends not to reward extreme parties. And yet what we're seeing to the horror of many people in the Republican establishment, or what used to be the Republican establishment, is you have a candidate who's taking positions that seem quite extreme on a number of issues. And I think that we may be seeing a crisis ahead for the Republican Party because the nature of the coalition that they have built over decades is now being called into question. Uh, precisely because you have a candidate who's taking what seems like relatively extreme positions uh, and is running up pretty good numbers but maybe just short of a majority. And again, with these demographic shifts we're seeing, uh, a lot of Republicans, the Bush families among them, very concerned that this is not going to work with you know, non-Cuban-American Latinos across the country. And Sean, can I just ask you, I mean, a lot is being made of the difference between the uh, presidential poll and the poll for, for congressmen. I mean, it, uh, and, and the markets, the financial markets, seem to be very happy. They say, oh, well, you know, we, we might have a... A Biden presidency, but we'll have a Republican Senate. This provides a balance. Do you think voters were actively looking for a balance in the system of governance? No. So I think voters uh, are looking for economic policies that help their their living standards. And uh, Joe Biden didn't deliver. Um, so he did. He even though fifteen dollars minimum wage is part of his platform, he never uh, talked about it. He never ran on that. Um, and so, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable that the Democrats have lost seats in the House uh, and they are not able to flip the Senate. I mean, everyone predicted they would be able to, to flip the Senate, but they're even losing seats in the House. So I think, and so this whole strategy since the 1990s, really, if you go back to Bill Clinton, his whole strategy was to sort of uh, move from working class economic issues more towards a professional managerial class uh, and moderate Republicans. So he's trying to bring moderate Republicans into the, into the fold. And Biden is sort of the culmination of this. You know, they called it the Biden Republicans. And this has completely failed. So 90% uh, of Republicans in 2016 voted for Donald Trump. In 2020, 93% of Republicans voted for Donald Trump. So even though Biden invited Repu moderate Republicans to the DNC, uh, you know, ran a lot on, on their platform, et cetera, and, you know, was sufficiently uh, disparaging and condescending to what he called the socialist left. And, you know, he beat the socialists. So that appeals to the moderate Republicans, and he tried. Um, but uh, it completely failed. If, if you run as Republican light, you would probably rather, rather vote for a Republican. And can I ask you about, uh, because we're, we're doing this from Hong Kong, international policy. I mean, do you think, particularly with regards to policy towards China, mm. uh, but perhaps more generally, mm. a Biden presidency would be that different from a Trump presidency in practical terms? I think it's difficult to overstate uh, how poorly regarded China is right now um, the, among Western liberal democracies. And uh, I think what's widely said is that Biden, although his tone will be much softer, uh, that may make him much more effective in terms of building diplomatic international coalitions uh, against China in the name of containment policy. You know, you look at the U.S. Congress right now, they can barely agree on what day of the week it is. And yet when this Hong Kong legislation comes before Congress, these bills are being passed basically unanimously. The president can't veto them even if he wants to. And I think one dissenting vote on the right, Hong Kong bill. Which is basically zero, right? Uh, so, you know, the, this level of sentiment, I think I would have to go back to, you know, the 1980s and U.S. sentiment toward the Soviet Union. And the thing is that as paralyzed and sclerotic as the American political system can be, it has a capacity for action when people are united. And I can't think of any issue in the last 20 or 30 years that unites Americans more now, for better or for worse, than China. And I think in terms of policy, the only difference is going to be that Biden will wind down the trade war. But in terms of uh, the you know, overall like, containment of China in, in technology, in military, et cetera, 
this is a bipartisan agreement in, in, uh, in, in Washington. I mean, Xi Jinping's foreign policy has been a complete disaster. Like, I mean, ever since you know, he rolled out the Great Rejuvenation of the Chinese Nation, uh, only ethnic Han people are excited by this. No one else in Asia and certainly the rest of the world is excited about returning to the pre-1839 uh, you know, world order. So uh, it's, it's, it's a complete disaster. And Biden, because you know, Trump is incompetent in many ways, but uh, he made all of, the, all of his allies angry. Uh, Biden will not. Biden is a very, uh, you know, he, he's, a, he's an Atlanticist, and he will revive the, the NATO alliance. If you'd watched this election in Beijing on, on state media, you would know that it was very violent, that it was very chaotic, that everybody was very unhappy. Do you think that, um, from the Chinese point of view, this has been a good election? So this is a natural tendency, uh, given the way media operates, uh, and I'm not casting blame here, but you know we tend to look for things that are, are newsworthy. Uh, and so I, I think at some level it's the, the representation of the American elections is understandable. But I think that if we see a peaceful transition of power in a relatively short period of time, and I remain hopeful that that's exactly what's going to happen, uh, once again, America will show that the elections give people a capacity for peaceful regime change. If enough people are unhappy enough, what elections do is they give them a chance to peacefully replace the government. Uh, and so you don't have to resort to violent resolutions of what is essentially political conflict. And there are a lot of lessons to be drawn in a lot of places, including Hong Kong, from that. And the lessons you draw? Uh, I'm not quite as optimistic <laughs> about the future of the United States right now. Okay. There's, <laughs> there's polarization <Fair>. both <laughs> between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, but also within the two parties. I mean, Trump basically did a hostile takeover of the Republican Party, and so for most of the past four years, most Republicans have completely fallen in line. But if Trump is booted out of the White House, there's going to be a, a, another civil war in the Republican Party between the populace and the establishment, and the same thing in the Democratic Party. I mean, the, the, the people who supported Bernie Sanders are not going away anytime soon. And, uh, you know, Biden is the most moderate centrist uh, candidate. I mean, he's even more moderate than Hillary Clinton, arguably. So the civil war on both sides is going to continue. Well, <laughs> on that happy note of civil war, thank you both very much indeed. Uh, we'll be back next week at the same time. We'll see you then. Goodbye. <laughs>